Alright, so it is time today to do limits. How many of you have seen a notion of a limit before? Right. Hopefully you've seen limits when you did Calc 1, Calc 2. Limits is a concept that is often not done rigorously in introductory calculus classes. We save it for the advanced real analysis classes. What I want to do today is talk a little bit about limits. I want to show you how you can make it rigorous, and then we will never do that again for the rest of the semester. I just want you to have a sense of what's there. For those of you who are considering a major in mathematics, you will get to see this in all the rigorous detail that you will want in later classes such as real analysis. I am not going to go through the beginning of the lecture on what is an open set and all that stuff. Those definitions are done online. If you are going to continue in mathematics, you really want to learn the language. Okay? The main thing is an open set is a generalization of an interval. So in one dimension, we have open intervals. And these are things, you know, A, B is the set of all X, A less than X less than B. The closed interval, and we put square brackets, will be the set of all X, A less than equal to X less than equal to B. It turns out for calculus, open intervals are very convenient. What it means is you have some point, and you have some neighborhood near that point. And you try to localize the action to what's happening in that small vicinity. And that's what we're going to be doing when we try to study limits. If you're trying to figure out what is your instantaneous speed, let's say when you're passing through Hartford, you know, on your way from Boston to Baltimore, it doesn't really matter what's going on in New York City. That doesn't affect what's going on at that instant. You can localize your function to just that little area. And that's essentially what we're going to be doing for limits. Okay? So the question is, how rigorously do we want to define limits? I have been doing this for three years, and so I do not feel the need to ask you how rigorously you want to do this. From talking to previous classes, I have a pretty good sense of how much rigor you want. I will do just a little bit more than you probably want, but not as much as you will get in a real analysis class. So, let's do the informal definition. <coughs> so, informal. The limit... Um, as n goes to infinity of a n is a if a n minus a goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Or, if I'm doing things for functions, the limit as x goes to x naught of f of x is L if the limit as x goes to x naught of f of x equals L. <coughs> I.e., the limit as x goes to x naught of f of x minus L equals 0. Okay? So if you want to think about what's going on, let me draw a little picture. Here's my x-axis. Here's my point x naught. Here's a value L. You know, here's my function y equals f of x. And so here's what's going on at some point x naught. So we'll say that as x gets close and closer to x naught, f of x gets close and close to L, then L is the limit as x approaches x naught. Okay? There's some subtleties. How many of you have seen a definition roughly like this at one point in your life? Okay. There's a subtlety in the definition. So whenever you see a definition, you always want to ask, what do the symbols mean? What does x converges to x naught or x approaches to x naught mean? Excellent. In this definition, x is not x naught. Okay? So, if I want to talk about what is the limit as x approaches x naught, I never let x equal x naught. 
What is the one division you are not allowed to do unless you're an engineer or a physicist with extensive training? Divide by zero. You're not allowed to divide by zero. So when we go back to the definition of the derivative, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. If h equals zero, we have zero over zero. Zero over zero is undefined. We're not allowed to divide by zero. Well, we make the restraint that h is never zero when we calculate these ratios. And when we make that restraint, or constraint, we're okay. So when we define the notion of a limit, the definition of the limit does not allow x to equal x naught. <laughs> and we talk about what happens as x gets closer and closer to x naught. Okay? Essentially, how many ways do we have to approach the point x naught? Two. Two, right? I can essentially approach from here, or I can approach from here. If I want, I could be doing you know, some kind of dance like this, jumping back and forth you know, on both sides, getting closer and closer and closer. But really, I'm approaching from the left, or I'm coming down from the right. Essentially, that is all I can do. Now, if I look at this as the plot of my function, I can change the value of the function at x0. Will that affect whether or not the limit exists? No. If I change the function at just one point, and then we'll put like an open circle to denote that we've changed the definition, and I now make the function defined over here, does the limit still exist? As x gets closer and closer to x0, does f of x approach a value? Yes. yes. Do you like this? No, right? We would call this function discontinuous. There is a jump. You know, if you look at it, as I get closer and closer and closer to this point, my function looks like it wants to take on this value, but it doesn't. So in this case, we would say f is discontinuous at the point x0. If the limit equals the value of the function at that point, we say it's continuous. So if f of x0 equals the limit as x goes to x0 of f of x, we say f is continuous at x0. And that's much better. We like functions that are continuous. They're much easier to analyze. When I'm doing all of my stuff, imagining you know, a car driving from Baltimore to Boston or Boston to Baltimore, is this an example of continuity or discontinuity? Are you driving your car? Yes. That's continuous. It should basically be continuous. I don't go from 20 miles per hour to 70 miles per hour. Right? I have to be traveling at a nice continuous speed. For a really good example of discontinuity, think of Star Trek. Think of the transporters. Well, all of a sudden, you know, one instant somebody is on the Enterprise, the next instant, you know, Ensign Redshirt is down on the planet about to be killed. Okay? This is a really good example of discontinuity, where all of a sudden, a moment later, you're in a very different situation. For the functions we want to look at and analyze, they're going to be continuous. So let's make our function continuous again. And now let's change the value of the function over here. Does this affect the continuity at this point? No. no. What if instead of like this, I change it for a larger window like this and make my function equal to that you know, very high straight line over here? Does that affect continuity? No. It's all about the limit as x goes to x0. I can just take a smaller and smaller and smaller band about x0. As long as I can draw a small little interval about x0 that stays away from the trouble here, it doesn't matter. Continuity limits these are local phenomena that are happening at a very small point. Okay? That's what really matters. Okay. Any questions about this? I'm going to give you a little bit more of the rigorous definition. Um, I don't think I'm going to go through the example using the rigorous definition. It's in the notes, it's online. There's actually a typo in the notes, in the rigorous definition. So if you can find the typo, email me for an extra credit. So the definition, uh, f is continuous at x0 if 
for all epsilon greater than zero, <coughs> there is a delta which may depend on x naught and epsilon such that f of x minus um, f of x naught is less than epsilon whenever x minus x naught is less than delta. What is the easiest point to check to see if f of x minus f of x naught is less than epsilon? Zero? Almost, not zero. Close. Zero, zero. Not zero, zero. What am I calling that special point in this problem? Don't. I'm calling it x naught, right? x naught might not be zero, it might not be the origin. If I plug in x equals x naught, is f of x naught minus f of x naught less than epsilon? Yeah, if epsilon is a small positive number, this is zero. This is very easy to check when x equals x naught. The difficulty is when x does not equal x naught. So if you think about what's going on, <coughs> here's x. Uh, here's x naught. Here, let's say this is the value of f of x naught. Think of epsilon as a tolerance. It's a game we're going to play. I don't know any student who ever wants to play this game, but you know, imagine for some strange reason this sounds appealing. I, and we're going to have the following challenge. You give me an epsilon, and I have to give you a delta. My epsilon, I'm sorry, the epsilon you give me, and the point you give me, is going to affect what delta I have to choose. And you say, I want to be at most one-tenth away from f of x naught. Can you tell me that if I'm sufficiently close to x naught, I'm going to miss by at most one-tenth? And my job is to find such a delta. And then when I give that to you, rather than saying, great job, professor, have some M&Ms, you did a good job today, you say, okay, well, you know what, that's too easy. I want you to be within 1 over 100. I said, fine, I, I'll use this as my delta. Then you say, you know, actually, I've changed my mind again. I want to be within 1 over 1,000. You know, at this point, I start getting frustrated. and said, fine, you want to be within 1 over 1,000. Here's the delta. Then you change your mind again. I want to be within 1 over 10,000. And so no matter what value you give me, no matter what tolerance you give me, I have to be able to find a delta to get closer and closer and closer. So if you think of what the plot of the function looks like, it's got to go through that point. So let's say it looks like something like this. If you give me a really large tolerance like this, you know, you were feeling very generous, you realized I was up late, you know, preparing this lecture. What can I take for delta? So let's say this is 1 over here, this is 4 over here, let's say this is 2.5. What could I take for my delta? How big of a window about x naught could I take? I'm sorry? If my function is always between these bands, I could take infinite. I've only drawn it from 1 to 4. So I don't know that it's going to stay between 1 and 4. So I, I agree with you that if it continues like this, I could take delta to be infinity. I'm always within that tolerance. If I force myself, however, to just look between 1 and 4, how large of a delta could I take? What could I take for my delta? Well, my point x naught is 2.5. How far can I move from x naught? I can move 1.5. So if you gave me this as your tolerance, I can take any delta at most 1.5, and I will be within the tolerance. And then you decide to make the life a little bit more challenging, and now you make your tolerance smaller. And so now, if you make this as your tolerance, I can no longer take a delta as large as 1.5. And so what I see is, well, you know, if I come straight down from here, and if I come from here, as long as I'm in this interval, the value of my function will be within the tolerance. And so I look at how far I can move to the left. 
I look at how far I can move to the right, the smaller of those two will be my delta. And we can keep playing the game and keep refining things. Okay? So this is the notion, the more rigorous notion of what it means for a function to be continuous. Right? That's the game we play. You give me an epsilon, I find a delta, and my delta will depend on the points. Okay? Where the function is varying greatly, my delta is probably going to be smaller. Where my function varies very little, I can probably take a larger delta. Okay. Any questions on what we've done here so far? Okay, so this is the key definition of a limit. For the most part, I really don't want to work this rigorously. I just want you to be aware of it. And we're going to just do the informal notion of we know a limit when we see it. Okay. Uh, one example that's worth doing, uh, and this does show up a bit, is example. <coughs> Let's look at the limit as x goes to 2 of x plus 2 over x um, plus 4. What will this limit equal? It'll equal what? Two thirds. So it's going to be 4 sixths or 2 thirds. And because everything is well behaved, I essentially just replace the numerator, I replace all the x's with 2, the denominator, I replace all the x's with 2. All right. Technically, what we're supposed to do is rigorously prove that if I go back to my notion of the limit, I take this, I subtract two-thirds, I show you give me any epsilon, I can find a delta, you don't want to do that, I don't want to do that, let's, you know, move on. Okay? What if I now give you the limit as x goes to two of x plus two over x minus two? What would that limit be? Yes. Infinity. Infinity or undefined. So if x is a, is a little bit greater than 2, it's going to go to positive infinity. If x is a little bit less than 2, it's going to go to negative infinity. So this is undefined. Let's do one last one. The limit is x goes to 2 of x squared minus 2 over x minus 2. What does this equal as x goes to 2? Zero. Why zero? Oh, wait a minute. Um, sorry. Let's do x squared minus 4 over x minus 2. Okay, so good. Why, why undefined? Because the bottom will be zero. The bottom will be zero. The top will be zero. But remember, when I say x goes to 2, you don't know what value x is, but you know what value x is not. What does x not equal? X does not equal 2. So if we stay away from X equals 2, this is the same as the limit as X goes to 2. Well, X squared minus 4, I can write as X minus 2, X plus 2, over X minus 2. If you listen very closely, this is screaming at you to do something. It's screaming, cancel the 2's, the X minus 2's. Because X does not equal 2. Because X doesn't equal to 2, I can just cancel these. All right, well, what's this limit going to equal now? Four. So in a situation like this, the limit is actually well defined. And then you could say, well, if I now made this my function, how should I interpret this function when x equals two? A really good way to interpret this function is to say, let's call this function equal to four. And so in fact, if you were to plot this function, here's two, here's four, the function looks like this. Right? It's 4 everywhere except at x equals 2. It seems reasonable to say, let's just make this function equal to 4 at this point. Okay? So these are some of the standard limit calculations to do. Okay? Any questions about these examples? What I want to do now is I want to tell you what you are not allowed to do in my class. Okay? There are a couple of things, you know, I'm not allowed to say you can't root for the Yankees, I've inquired, uh, I am not allowed to do that. But, there are some mathematical symbols that I want you to be very careful about. Which symbols do you think you have to be very careful with? Infinity. Infinity. So, be careful 
with infinity divided by infinity, infinity minus infinity, zero times infinity. These things are not well defined, and they depend greatly on the problem. So if you want, I will sketch a proof that in some cases, zero times infinity is negative one. Okay? So, sometimes, zero times infinity is negative one. So imagine I take two lines that are perpendicular. So this has slope m1, this has slope m2. Does anybody remember the property of two slopes if they're perpendicular? It's a beautiful relation. Negative one. M1 times M2 is negative one. As a nice exercise, if you want to try to prove this, imagine you have a big circle over here, and you have this as the angle theta, and this is theta plus 90 degrees. You can write down the point here as cosine theta sine theta, and the point here as cosine theta plus pi halves sine theta plus pi halves. You've now got point slope, calculate the slopes, and you'll see that the product is equal to negative one. What's the one situation where the product of the slopes might not be negative one? Where might, yes? When they're along the axes. So in the special case, when these are my slope, when these are my lines, the slope of this line is zero, the slope of this line is infinity. Well, if you think about what's going on, the product of the slopes is negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one undefined, negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one, undefined. It makes sense to then say, well, you know, in this case, zero times infinity is negative one. Okay? You've got to be careful whenever you have infinities. Dangerous things can happen. Okay? Any questions about this example? I want to give you, yes? So would you say that it is actually negative 1, or would you say that it is that? I would say if you're interpreting the product of the slopes, I would say the product of the slopes here is negative 1. But undefined is absolutely okay. So let me give you an example of just you know, some other dangerous things. So let's look at example. The limit as x goes to infinity of x squared minus x. The limit as x goes to infinity of x minus x squared. And the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared minus x squared. What is the first limit equal? What's the first limit? Infinity. Infinity. So, x is huge, but x squared is much, much larger than x. You know, a thousand squared is much larger than a thousand. This first limit is going to be plus infinity. What about the second limit? It'll be negative infinity. And what about the third limit? Infinity minus infinity. But let's think. How many of you have ever read Henry David Thoreau? Okay. He is the patron saint of mathematics. He has very sage advice for you. What line of Henry David Thoreau am I thinking of? Yes. Uh, <coughs> simplify, simplify. Simplify, simplify. I'll toss you two M&Ms for that. <laughs> now, what should Thoreau have said instead of simplify, simplify? Simplify. He should have simplified, simplify, simplify to simplify, but he wanted to really drive home the point, so I will allow him. When I was a postdoc at Brown, uh, there was a very rich patron of the university who loved Henry David Thoreau, and he actually bought a lot of Thoreau's stuff and donated it to Brown, including the college textbook he used when he was an undergraduate at Harvard. And in fact, we actually had his math book with his notes. And so it was very interesting to see Thoreau do mathematics. You normally don't think of him that way. Why is simplify, simplify, sage advice? Before you do any math calculation, look and see, can you make things easier? Can you simplify things before you start doing a lot of algebra? So, 
Spotify here for all. Simplify, simplify. Before I start doing this calculation, well, what's x squared minus x squared? So this is just the limit as x goes to infinity of zero. Okay, that I can do. It's identically zero. Okay? What I would love to do is I would love to say the limit of a difference is... What rule would you love to have true? The limit of a difference is the... Difference of the limits. Difference of the limits. Right? If you could choose... Okay? Let's go back to Calc 1. If you could choose what the product rule would be or what the quotient rule would be, would you choose what you learned? No. If you were designing the universe, you might try to design the universe in such a way that the derivative of a product is the product of the derivatives. Not happening. Okay? You'd love to have the limit of a difference is the difference of the limits. Not happening. What is the difficulty? Why does that break down? It breaks down when one of the two limits is infinity. If both limits are infinity, boy, are we in trouble. But if at least one of the limits is infinite, you're in trouble. If both limits are finite, everything's okay. And then you will have the limit of the difference is the difference of the limits. So what I want to do now is I want to just talk about some of the key limit laws. And then when we get into derivatives later, we will see these limit laws lead to corresponding rules for derivatives. Okay. Any questions on this example before we go? Yes? So what were you showing that we, that we should, that's tricky because you're talking about infinity? Well, I'd love to say this, I would love to say <coughs> is the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared minus the limit as x goes to infinity of x. But if I do that, this is equal to infinity this is equal to infinity. I have infinity minus infinity. Infinity minus infinity is not defined. And so, in that situation, I don't know what it is. All three of these are actually infinity minus infinity. In the first one, infinity minus infinity is infinity. In the second, it's negative infinity. In the third, it's zero. Okay? So what I want to do is I want to show you which rules of derivative, I'm sorry, which rules of limits are actually true. And what are the conditions? So one of the biggest mistakes people make is they use math theorems without checking to see if the conditions are met. A great example is the financial crisis. A lot of people used certain formulas to price options to figure out what's going to happen without checking to see if the assumptions were reasonable. Hint, they weren't. And so they were using formulas in places where you had absolutely no right to assume that they would be acceptable to use. Okay, so now what we're going to do is limit laws. So the one is the constant rule. If the limit as x goes to, uh, do you guys want to have x go to, well, let's have it go to x naught. If the limit as x goes to x naught of f of x equals L, then the limit as x goes to x naught of c times f of x equals what? C times L. C times L. Think of this as changing things from meters to feet, or miles to kilometers. When I multiply by C, I'm changing my units of measurement. So if I'm converging to being five miles from home, and now instead of measuring things in terms of, instead of miles, if I now use kilometers, it's about 1.6 uh, kilometers make a mile, I would now be about 8 kilometers from home. Okay? So if I just multiply all of my numbers by C, the limit multiplies by C. The next is the sum difference rule. If the limit as x goes to x naught of f of x equals um, L1, and the limit as x goes to x naught of g of x equals L2, then the limit as x goes to x naught of f of x plus g of x is equal to L1 plus L2. And similarly, for the difference. 
So if you think about it, if I'm converging to getting $1,000 in my bank account and you're converging to getting $10,000 in your bank account, then together we're converging to having $11,000 in our bank account. Okay. What condition do I need to add for this to be true? Right. Technically, I only need one of the limits to be finite. So we will do assuming limits are finite. I don't mind erring on the side of having slightly stronger conditions. Okay? All right, we've done the constant, we've done the sum difference. What do you think is next? Product. Product. All right. Not very surprising. Product. Fg as above, the limit as x goes to x0 of f of x, g of x, equals L1, L2, again, assuming finite. Right? So as long as we assume that the limits are finite, everything is okay. What's the last one? Quotient. So F, G, L1, L2 as above, the limit as X goes to F to X naught of F of X over G of X equals L1 over L2. <coughs> Anything else? Do I need anything else for this? L2 can't equal zero. Excellent. And L2 is not equal to zero. Right? We are not allowed to divide by zero. So as long as L2 is not equal to zero, this is fine. There's one situation where maybe we could be okay if L1 is equal to zero as well. Well, zero over zero is undefined. We've got to really do more work for that. As long as L1 and L2 are non-zero, this is no problem. Any questions on these different limit laws? There is one other limit law I'm not going to do in class. It's in the lecture notes online. If you can't have two different values for your limit. So if x approaches you know, 5, I can't be approaching 7 miles from home and 12 miles from home. Right? If the limit exists, the limit should be well defined. I can't approach two different values simultaneously. Okay. These are the key facts we need about limits. And now that we have that, now we can move on and we can start talking about calculus. Okay? You know, <coughs> I.e., the point of this class, you know, finally. Any questions on limits before I erase this and we change? Okay. If you have not picked up a piece of artwork by Kayla, you know, please grab one if you want before. As I said, if you've seen the Karate Kid Part 2, just like there's the secret of Miyagi Karate, this is the secret of Miller Calc 3. Now, unfortunately, and I know this is being recorded, so Kayla might watch this later, while I appreciate the fact that she was drawing these personalized uh, swirlies, as she calls them, or scribbles, as I call them, she ran out of steam and stopped somewhere around the low 20s. So I, I will admit I have scanned in and printed out a bunch of them so that there's enough for everyone. Some of you do not have original artworks. You have... <laughs> Although I can assure you that the difference in price, you know, 20 years from now, should be negligible. I can. This is the secret to Calc 3, okay? Uh, I will hold up a good picture. Oh yeah, this is a, this is a nice scribble, okay? <laughs> This is the secret. If you understand this picture, you understand the most difficult concept of Calc 3 and why two dimensions, or three or higher, is so much harder than one dimension. Okay? What does this have to do with calculus? It's a ceiling. I'm sorry? <laughs> <laughs> what have we been talking about today? Limits. Limits. So when you have a limit, you have a path. You have to look as x approaches x naught in one dimension. Is it really challenging to talk about how x approaches x naught? No. 
you really have two options in one dimension. So limits, or let's call it limit tax. One dimension, x goes to x naught, it's boring. I can go like this, or like this. That's essentially all I can do. Ah, but two in higher dimensions, or more. It's now exciting. You know, I'm not nearly as good of an artist as Kayla. I have to be able to analyze what is going on if I choose this path. Okay? It would be a nightmare to write this path down. Okay? But when I look at all paths as x goes to x naught, I have to study something like this. Okay? This is what's going to make it significantly harder to deal with limits. Okay? So that's why I say this is the secret to Calc 3. You always have to think, I have something like this. Okay? Alright, so let's do an example. So I will do the same example that's in my notes. Let's do f of xy equals xy um, over x squared plus y squared. Okay? You have to calculate the limit for every possible path. Ooh. Can anybody think of a nice path to take? I want a nice, and I need a point. So if you had to choose a point, what point would you like? Zero. Zero. So let's look at the limit as the point x, y goes to the point zero, zero of f of x, y. So path one, somebody give me an easy path to approach the origin. There's two natural candidates. What's a good candidate to approach the origin? Left and right, come down the x-axis. Path one is the x-axis. Well, along the x-axis, what's going on? I'm happy to throw them to you. If you ever want an M&M when you answer a question, I'm happy to throw at you. Uh, if you want to play defense for people who are nearby and try to steal from the court. So if you come along the x-axis, this is all points of the form x comma zero. When I take the points x comma zero, x is not equal to zero, what is this fraction going to equal? So along the x-axis, what is this going to equal? X zero. Zero. zero over x squared. So along the x-axis, it's zero over x squared. Get zero over x squared, and that just goes to zero. What's another good path to take? Y-axis. So if you do path 2, y-axis, this is all points 0, y. This is going to give you 0 over y squared. In fact, not only does it go to 0, it's always 0. So does this prove that the limit exists and the limit is 0? Not even close. We haven't checked squiggly path 5, right? And there's infinitely many squiggly paths to take. Well, to prove that a limit doesn't exist, I just have to find two paths that give a different answer. Can somebody give me another path to check? What would be a good path to take? Uh, this is two dimensions. So. X equals Y. X equals Y. So come down the diagonal line. So path 3, x equals y, so it's all points, say, h, h. Ah, if I take all points h, h, I'm going to get h squared over h squared plus h squared. Well, what's h squared plus h squared? 2h squared. So I'm going to get h squared over 2h squared. What does that equal? 1 half. So limit does not exist. Limit doesn't exist. OK? 
okay? And so this is the danger. Just because the limit exists for some paths does not mean the limit exists for all paths. Okay? Any questions about this example? So this is a really good example of the dangers and what can go wrong. I'm not going to go through the example of switching to polar coordinates. You know, watch the video. The video goes through that and does an exercise. I have an example written up in the book. Polar coordinates is a really good way of working through some of these limits. Okay? What I want to do now is we've got about eight minutes left. So at this time, maybe we'll go back and we'll do polar. I want to do partial derivatives. So we will learn half of the course, essentially, partial derivatives in one minute or less. When I play chess with Kim right now, I spot him a queen and a rook. He has 15 minutes on the clock. I have three minutes. This is just enough to make the games interesting. Okay? I, it's a pain. In, oh, this is being recorded. It's a pain to reset the clock. So I am going to give myself three minutes to teach you partial derivatives. All right? Is this visible on? No. No. I, no don't touch it. I'll, I'll just try it. What if I put it here? Yes. So there's a count of three minutes. I will teach you partial derivatives in one minute or less. Right? It's a pain to reset the clock to give myself just one minute, so I will give myself three minutes, but all right. I will allow myself to erase the board before I start. Right? So. Anybody ever see the movie Something About Mary? Alright, so this is kind of like the six minute apps. Alright? You guys ready? So, it doesn't click exactly as much as I'm right, ready. Let's try to get one, two, three, go. So, the partial derivative of f of x1, xn with respect to the variable xk denoted partial f partial xk at the point a1 an so at the point a equals a1 an is obtained by considering all other variables constant and just do the standard derivative with respect to x k. <laughs> Close, right? Uh, it took a lot longer than normal. I decided to actually write the whole thing. That's it. You've now learned partial derivatives. Essentially, all you do for partial derivatives is just pretend all the other variables have their value fixed. Imagine you have six variables, and five of them have their value fixed. How many free variables do you have? One. What class are we now reduced to? Calc 1. This is what we love to do in math. We love to reduce things to previously done classes. Okay? So all we do is we consider every other variable fixed. Right. This is the definition. Okay. So for example, let's say I give you f of x, y is equal to x squared y plus y cubed x. This is a function of two variables, right? What if I now look at the function g of x equals f of x Three. That's going to be 3x squared plus 27x. Do you know how to take the derivative of the function 3x squared plus 27x? Yes. g prime of x is just 6x plus 27. How many of you have used the notation prime before? Prime is good and bad notation. When you only have one variable of interest, 
it's clear what you're taking the derivative with respect to. So the prime means to take the derivative of the function. Well, there's no y variable going on. I'm taking the derivative with respect to x. The prime means take the derivative of my function. If I have several variables, now it's not so clear what's the variable for differentiation. And that's why we need better notation. So sometimes we write this as dA, dg dx equals g prime of x. That's much better notation. It indicates what is the variable being differentiated, what is the function. We want a way to specify what's going on when we have several variables. And so we will later see the concept of the full derivative. So not surprisingly, a bunch of partial derivatives together will give you the full derivative. And so df dx would mean take the derivative of my function f with respect to x and hold everything else constant. And if I want to evaluate it at a certain point, I could just put in, maybe I want to know what's going on at the point uh, 1, 3. Yes? What's the difference between the two ways of writing b? This indicates I'm taking a partial derivative. It indicates that there's more variables going on, that there's other variables in the background. So it's, you can quickly look down and get a sense of what's happening. That's why I like notation like this. I know that there's more that meets the eye than just the variable x of interest. This is partial derivatives. So now, if I ask you to calculate the partial derivative of f with respect to x, I can go back here. I just imagine that y equals 3. Except I don't write down y equals 3. I just leave y as a free variable. But in my mind, I consider y fixed. So what would be the derivative of this function with respect to x? The partial derivative of this function with respect to x. What would it be? So the partial derivative of f with respect to x. 2x, 2xy, 2x, y, plus y cubed. And again, if I put in y equals 3, I would get back to this. If I want to know what's the partial derivative at the point 1, 3, I now take x to be 1 and y to be 3, and I put that in. This is all you need to do for partial derivatives. We're going to do a lot more uh, the week after the exam on notation on a rigorous way of defining how do we take partial derivatives with respect to limits. Well, you're going to go back to the definition of calc 1. And now you're going to have all the coordinates fixed, but the one coordinate you care about, and that's what goes on. What path does this avoid? What very difficult shape are we no longer having to deal with? Squigglies, right? This completely kills all the squigglies, right? We're keeping all the variables fixed but one. We're forcing ourselves to go down along the x-axis, along the y-axis, along the z-axis. It makes the analysis much easier. So on the homework, you know, your last problem, is, or your last few problems, is compute the first order partial derivatives. The first order partial derivatives just means take the partial with respect to all the variables. So the first one, you've got a function of x and y. Find the partial with respect to x. Find the partial with respect to y. That's all you need to do. <coughs> okay. So I will be sending you an email with the stuff later today. Um, I will be in my office. Oh.